So I want to talk with you about bias and truth and the world we inhabit, where it is we live. Before we start talking about ideas, people's ideas, views of religions, philosophies, it kind of helps to know where we are. Um, and I use the title, What is Water? because it has to do with the parable of the fish and the frog. Um, so you have this frog sitting up on the lily pad, and um, you know, the fish swim by, and he says, hey guys, how's the water today? And of course the fish are like, what the heck is water? Um, it surrounds them, and it, it flows through them, it's, it's everything they know. And, um, it is the totality of their reality as fish. <clears throat> Not so for the frog, but in some sense, that gives you an idea of how we can often live our lives um, not recognizing the culture, the ideas that permeate uh, where we live, who we are, how people think, the things we do, what we value, um, our art, our music, our TV, <clears throat> our movies, all these things influence us, and a lot of times we don't realize to what degree and in what ways, how it affects our thinking and impacts what we see, how it impacts the way we think about what others think. Um, things that we think obvious that other cultures may not think obvious, and vice versa. So, um, just some thoughts on the water we inhabit. Um, we can talk about nominalism. This is the idea that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Um, in much of the world and much of history, in different places and times, there's been the idea that there is something that is beautiful, that is beauty. There, there is a standard. Um, there is a reality. Um, nominalism basically says, no, um, you bring meaning to things, but things don't have meaning. Um, you see what what exists is just the, the meager facts of it, and that, that can transcend into how we do science, how we do art, um, <clears throat> how we research, how we understand. Um, it's the idea if you want to know things, you need to know the least common denominator of things. Um, and, and it really kind of can do away with some, some of the meaning. Um, Another one we might say deism. Um, it's because most people honestly don't disbelieve in a god of sorts. Um, but when it comes down to day-to-day -day life, whatever god may be is, is out there. I don't know if you ever saw the movie um, What Dreams May Come, but Robin Williams' character gets to heaven and the, the person that's kind of giving him the tour he asks her, well, what about God? And she says, oh, he's out there somewhere looking down on us. Um, so that even in heaven, there's, if there's a God, he's distant. It's something other, something important. If, or a more recent and a little more comical view, um, if you've seen the show, The Good Place with Ted Danson, um, you know, there's really no God figure in that. There is some kind of distant judge. Um, but nothing like any of the world religions would consider to be like the, the ultimate god. Um, it's this odd sort of place where it, it works, um, and it, it may, on some levels, have some commonalities with Hinduism's idea of of dharma and karma. But we won't go there. It's not definitely not a complete view of that. But um, so Deism would say, you know, be true to yourself, authentic. How do you feel? You know, what feels right to you, you do that. There's no law out there, really. There's no lawgiver, ultimately. So on a, on a social level, we form our own laws. We form social contracts on an individual level. You know, as long as you're not hurting somebody else, um, though it never questions where we get the idea that you shouldn't hurt somebody else. Um, as long as we're not hurting someone else, you know, um, do, do what you want. Uh, be true to yourself. Be authentic. If you go against your feelings, you're not being authentic, which is actually very foreign to most religious systems in the world, um, which would tell you don't necessarily trust your feelings. Your feelings may lead you into things that aren't healthy and aren't good. Um, you have to be disciplined. You follow certain standards that are set. Um, 
and and we can uh, combat the nominalism of life with a romanticism, right? All you need is love. But if you think about that, it's sort of a nominalism it's, of its own, um, because we kind of reduce love down to this sort of sexual, uh, I don't know, sexual enjoyment, sexual um, connections, and there's really not a deep investigation of what it means to love. Um, it's it's equated with the feelings of being in love, and there again, if you have to be true to yourself when you fall out of love, you move on. That's you know that's romanticism, and and that's a large part how the world we live in in the United States of America today in the 21st century works. And when it comes to academia and the study of what is truth, what is fact. We can add to it that the idea with an academic study, the big thing is materialism. And materialism basically says that if you want to know truth, then what you want to know is fact. And fact is measurable. You can you know see it, taste it, touch it, feel it, you can measure it, you can put it on a scale, you can measure the speed, you can film it, you can um this is what we can know. And beyond that, there is really no truth. Um, but that, that's the measures of truth, and anything else is, is something other than, than truth. And, and that's materialism. What is, is stuff. Beyond that, eh, we, don't, we don't know. We can't, we can't make a study of it necessarily. We can't uh, make a judgment call on it because it's just, it's beyond that, beyond that material thing that can be measured, what we would say scientifically. Um, that's what's real. Everything else, eh, that's that's your opinion, your feeling, your thought, and it's not the same level of reality. Um, that's a large part of how this world we live in tends to work, tends to see things, tends to study things. Um, and there's a reading you'll have uh, by an, a prominent uh, geneticist, Lewinton, who is an atheist, and he writes this article where he critiques um, an article by Carl Sagan actually and he is talking about um, putting the correct view of the universe into people's heads um, he said we first have to get an incorrect view out and so his critique of Sagan is not that Sagan's giving people the incorrect view um, but that he says people believe a lot of nonsense about the world of phenomena nonsense that is a consequence of the wrong way of thinking the primary problem is not to provide the problem public with the knowledge of how far it is to the nearest star, etc. The problem is to get them to reject irrational and supernatural explanations of the world, the demons that exist only in their imaginations. Now, see what Lewinson is saying is that anything that's not measurably real, anything that's not scientifically verifiable in his mind is irrational. Supernatural explanations are irrational. And in fact, at some points in his article, he he puts them on the level of superstition, which is why he puts their demons, and he talks about only in their imagination. Um, so he wants people to accept a social and intellectual apparatus that science is the only beginner of truth. Um, and that's fairly common, uh, especially within, if you think about the New Atheist Movement, that's out there, uh, Richard Dawkins, Dennett, um, some others who slipped my mind at the moment. But um, this is, in academia, even frequently, among people who may have a spiritual belief on a more milder level, um, when it comes to what's factual, what's knowable, they want what's scientifically verifiable. And they won't talk about any other kind of reality or or knowable truth <clears throat> here again this is a further kind of definition of that materialism that we see from Lewinton um, we exist as material beings in a material world all of whose phenomena are the consequences of physical relations among material entities the interesting thing is um, when Lewinton makes these claims they're not actually scientifically verifiable. The nature of spirit to someone who believes in spirit is that it's not physical. And so to say the only way we can know reality is through a physical means, 
scientific method. Observation, measure, correction of observation, hypothesizing about observation. These are all physical. This is a physical tool. It's a restricted tool. It's a good tool. It's a useful tool. It's a helpful tool and has done wonderful things. But it can't prove or disprove the existence of spirit, of God, of angels, of demons, of healing, of intuition, of anything. Um, not completely. It, it's simply not the tool for that. So to make the claim that we are strictly material beings in a material world is not actually scientifically verifiable. We'll get into that more later, but it's interesting to keep in mind as we think about how we think about the world. Um, this is kind of a response going along those lines. Wolfgang Smith um, is just an a incredibly intelligent uh, astrophysicist, scientist, mathematician, um, who is also a religious believer. Uh, he says, science is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, there is scientific truth, a bona fide knowledge of a special kind. But that knowledge is accompanied in practice by a syndrome of philosophic assumptions which are generally mistaken for scientific truths. It became clear to me, moreover, in light of the metaphysical traditions, that these scientists, scientistic beliefs, as I call them, tend to be spurious and deleterious to our spiritual well-being. I became convinced, in fact, that the spiritual and moral decline of modern civilization, our estrangement from spiritual reality, is due in no small measure to the scientistic worldview, which has been foisted upon us in the name of science. Note that he's making a distinction between science as a useful tool, as a useful way of knowing, a restricted but useful way of knowing, and what he would call scientism or scientistic beliefs. The idea that all that's knowable is what we can know through science, and nothing else is knowable as true or factual. Um, and note also he talks about um, the great traditions of the spiritual traditions, spiritual um, beliefs in, in the world, uh, world religions, that this is um, to him a place to find other sources of truth and other insights into reality. Um, and this is not, you know, some flake. I mean, this is a, an intelligent, scientifically minded, mathematically minded man. So it gives pause to the idea that those who would say, well, science is the only way of knowing. At the same time, I wanted to bring up that pause, but I want you to realize that within academics, we often simply accept that scientific view without question. And that's something we need to not do if we're going to take seriously and look seriously at the views of our own culture, of, of those who hold to religious views within our own culture, of those of other religions outside of our culture. Um, we need to understand that underlying view of the world that may be lacking in some ways and why it may be lacking. For instance, okay, we have a picture of a cat in a paper bag. Um, you know, maybe somebody out there likes, would like, has just this drive, this temptation, hatred of cats or some kind of appeal to, I don't know, some sixth sense of, of you know, loud, horrible noises and bad smells but decides that he would like to close the bag up and set it on fire with the cat in it. And we all think that's horrible, right? That's cruel, that's harsh, that's mean, that's bad, that's evil, maybe. But how do we know? Scientifically, how do we know that I can't set a cat in a bag on fire? Science can measure the temperature that the bag ignites. Uh, science can possibly measure the decibels that the cat screams. Um, there's a lot that science can measure and determine about that very horrible act, but science really can't tell us that it's horrible. But we actually have laws against people doing things like that. Why is that? Um, 
this challenge, this problem, is something that philosophers have dealt with for generations, especially um, in the 1800s, 1900s, even to today, is um, there was this shift in this desire to make every bit of knowledge as verifiable, as sound, as solid, as something we could know through the scientific method. And people wanted to come up with some kind of moral philosophy that that worked like the scientific method. But most of those philosophies end up with major holes in them. Um, you know, uh, utilitarianism, do the most good for the most people, the least harm to the least people, uh, may sound pretty good unless you happen to be part of the minority. Um, so how, how do we measure the most good for that matter? What, what do we measure as good? I mean, to say the most good is a, is a value judgment. Good in what way? Feels good? Makes us live longer? Um, makes us feel happier? What if burning cats in bags is what makes the majority of people happy? Wouldn't make me happy, but I mean, how would we say, well, no, that would be sick. A sick society would do that. How can we judge that scientifically? There must be some other way of knowing, some other way of addressing issues like this. This is the problem of fact versus value that comes out of a philosophical movement in the West, um, in the U.S., and in Europe, um, starting during the Enlightenment period, uh, and a little before, really, with Descartes. If you've heard of Descartes, the cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, um, he's looking to see, to try to determine how does physical reality and rational mental reality fit together. Um, and he ends up dividing things between cognitive entity, entities, those are the things that happen in our mind, and extended entities, those things that we see, touch, taste, feel, smell. Um, and it, it begins this real debate between what takes prevalence. Is it stuff that gives rise to thought, or thought that gives rise to stuff? How do they interact? How do they relate? Which is, which is more important? How are they divided? And through this chain of, of kind of philosophical history, we see this develop rather quickly into this problem of fact versus value. A fact is the temperature at which that bag ignites into flame. Value is whether or not we should burn that cat in that picture. Um, and fact is scientifically verifiable and therefore has more validity somehow than value. That's problematic for a culture. It's problematic for understanding and for learning and for knowledge and for understanding of truth. Um, it's rooted in Descartes. I can't go into that whole history now. You'll get some more of it probably over the course of some other things that we read. Um, it goes back to Galileo. I mean, consider this quote. If the ears, the tongue, and the nostrils were taken away, the figure, the motions, and the numbers would indeed remain, but not the odors, nor the taste, nor the sounds, which without the living animal I do not believe are anything else than names. Having now seen that many affections which are reputed to be qualities residing in the external object have no, have truly no other existence than in us. Galileo is essentially saying... Um, Smell is not real. Taste is not real. Sound is not real. Um, there are things, there are interpretations that our mind does. And these are philosophical arguments that go on to this day. But he would contend that figure, like shape, square, circle, triangle, motion, movement, that those are real. Numbers, those are real. Those are, um, those exist as external objects. Um, to some people that sounds really good until um, uh, there's another philosopher that comes up pretty soon afterwards and basically says, well, how do I see a figure? Well, I can only see a figure if there is a distinction in color. You know, I can look at a whiteboard and say, don't you see that square up there without drawing anything? Well, there's a square there. There's maybe an infinite number of squares there, but you can only see a square if I take a marker of some other color than white and write, draw lines that form a square on that board. Yet, does color have a reality? I mean, um, this, I mean those are the issues that come up. 
um, when you start trying to reduce everything, you know, that nominalism and that materialism to the things that are measurable in the most absolute forms, um, it, it really creates problems. And in fact, uh, there's a, a major philosophical problem currently in the West, uh, the philosophy of time and this effort to make the most accurate clock possible. Um, Einstein himself said, look, time is relative. I mean, you know, time spent with friends eating tremendous brownies and drinking wonderful coffee is not the same, you know, 20 minutes of that is not the same as 20 minutes of having a tooth drilled by a dentist. Uh, they measure the same on the clock, but not in the human mind. And, and why, how, how do we determine um, scientifically what's going on there? Um, it just, there's so many things that are beyond this kind of measurement of the figure and the motion and the number. Um, so I've mentioned deism as, as the root of that. It brings me to a little bit of a, of a religious point. Um, there is atheism. Atheism is the belief in no God. Um, agnosticism, there are different kinds of agnosticism. One says, I, I don't know. Another says, no one can know. And those are two very different things. We won't go into that here. But I wanted to distinguish theism as, a, as an important uh, formative thought uh, idea in the development of Western thought, the Western ideas, and the culture, and the, and the um, underpinning the ideas of how we see the world and, and do things in Western academia, typically, that, that water we swim in. Um, so on that, the right-hand side of your screen, you see theism, pantheism, theism, panentheism. We'll get into those others later. Just briefly, pantheism is essentially that God and everything are one. There's nothing that is that's not God. There's no God that's not everything or something. It's all blended together completely and entirely. Um, theism is this idea that, you know, He's got the whole world in his hands. Um, God is something completely other than the world. Um, he's made something other, and it's 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 separate um, in some very real format. Panentheism is the idea that everything that exists holds together in God. Um, and those are some very interesting things. We'll, we'll talk about those more as we get into religions, but... At this point, in looking at our culture, especially at our intellectual culture and our, our history of our ideas in the West, our philosophy and where we come from and, and kind of where we are now um, in the modern kind of secular culture that we live in, um, theism is like God is this clockworker. And it can seem like theism at points because God is other, but within theism, God, though he's other, will interact with the world that is made. He'll intervene, he'll speak into it, he'll touch, he'll enter, um, he'll draw things out of, he'll take action on behalf of. In deism, whatever this God is, this, this being out there, it set things into motion and left it. And so um, when you get into the Enlightenment period in the 1700s and um, thereafter, uh, there's a desire to move away from God being involved because that makes things difficult for science. Um, this is with regard to the material world, we can at least go so far as this. We can perceive that events are brought about not by insulated interpolations of divine power exerted in each particular case, but by the establishment of general laws. Uh, this is deism at its core. Uh, Bacon is not quite so deist, he, but he's influenced by it. And, and Bacon's idea is, the, is kind of a, um, a, a real optimism about the ability of what man can know uh, through scientific investigation. Um, and this is part of what 
we've inherited that, that creates some of these problems of fact versus value. Because you find very quickly that um, scientific method is not a good method for trying to measure God or determine if there is a God. Um, it maybe can help. We can talk about first causes and cause and effect, but, but it's very limited. And so this kind of optimism of Bacon and some others leads pretty soon to, uh, in Western culture, an attack on theistic beliefs and a move deeper into deism and eventually into kind of an intellectual agnosticism or atheism where um, by the 60s you have a... a um, a sociologist, a scholar in religion who says that we have to study religion from an atheistic perspective, which is odd, and, and you have to wonder why why do we have to? And it, it lies in his understanding of the cultural milieu that we live in. So um, this is part of that development. Um, and that deism leads to a story um, which is the idea of progress. Um, this is, again, part of the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution that follows, is that our underlying story of the world is progress. Things are getting better and better. Um, the world of the past was dark and dreary and ignorant, but we've, you know, we've gotten rid of some of our superstitions. We've kind of put God on the outside with the minimal contact so we can measure and and investigate and come to understand everything. And God becomes kind of a God of the gaps. It is, God is really only necessary where we can't understand. And probably won't be necessary because we'll eventually think we'll understand everything. Very optimistic about human knowledge and understanding through scientific processes. Um, but what really seems to come of it, if you read modern literature, um, late 1800s, early 1900s, if you think of Heart of Darkness, if you think of the work of Nietzsche, um, if you think of uh, some of your uh, novelists in America, F. Scott Fitzgerald and, and uh, Faulkner, um, Steinbeck, um, there's this sense of disconnectedness from each other, human disconnect from the world, a sense of alienation, disconnected um, and certainly a disconnectedness from God. Uh, Nietzsche's statement, God is dead. Um, this seems to flow out of that um, that whole um, just alienation becomes this, this theme throughout modern literature and, and modern art. Um, man against nature, man against man, man against self even. Um, if you ever read Catcher in the Rye, uh, that's kind of the end of modernism, is a, is a person who doesn't even know himself, in a sense. Um, this comes out of this reality, and this is a quote from Houston Smith, who's a religion scholar, who wrote the book Why Religion Matters. Um, and he basically says, look, science cannot tell us if anything is outside our universe. Um, and he goes on to say, if science can't, what, what can? Nothing definitely, but it would be foolish not to draw on every resource available. Um, inclusively, things are neither as science says they are, nor as religion says they are. They are as science and religion and philosophy and art and common sense and our deepest intuitions and our practical imaginations say they are. Um, he goes on to talk about... Um, this wondrously clear and inspiring world. Smith seems to see all the major world religions as kind of having this one central core um, kind of distilled world view. Uh, I don't fully agree with him on that. I think there's more difference between the major world religions than that. However, I think something that he's getting at, which is true, um, is a difference between modern secular culture and most traditional cultures throughout history and around the world. And that is, um, this comes from a book on uh, 
basically the idea of the great chain of being, which was a prevalent idea for Muslims, Christians, Jews, um, even some kind of uh, probably Zoroastrian types in Persia, uh, people early on, early Middle Ages who, um, you know, leading up to the fall of Rome, um, who held to some uh, Neoplatonic ideas, um, philosophers that weren't necessarily Muslim, Christian, or Jewish, uh, who were kind of outside the norm. Nonetheless, they all held to this idea, what was called the great chain of being. And um, it's this idea that all of reality exists in this chain of relationships, of, of um, a hierarchy, in a sense, that starts with the, the most, when he talks about the most meager kind of existence, um, you know, dirt, and ranges all the way up to the ends perfectissimum, and it's it's that's kind of a, a generalized Latin term for the the ultimate reality, the source of of universal reality. Um, for the Christians, for the Jews, for the Muslims, it would have been God. Um, differently understood for each. For Neoplatonists, it would have been the good, um, as Plato talks about. Uh, so that underlying idea um, for probably well over, well at least close to, probably well over a thousand years, is really at the heart of most ways of seeing the world. It, it would be almost um, comparable to the fact that most um, educated people today, whether they're Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Jew, atheist, agnostic, um, just kind of spiritual but not religious, if you asked us about the makeup of the universe, we would start talking about solar systems and galaxies and stars and, and dust and, and black holes. Um, it was that type of reality. It was an underlying reality. Um, and it fit within their conception of God. It had some diversities, but like I said, between the different religions. But this underlying view of something transcendent um, as existence kind of flowing down from this ultimate reality. Um, so that that was a consistent view. You see it in a lot of literature. Think of, um, you know, think of Hamlet's speech. Uh, I, I posted a link to a, a video of one of Hamlet's soliloquies uh, done by Kenneth Brenna, where, you know, he's talking about what a work is man, you know, and these these incredible things that he has to say about man, because man in that worldview, um, man is at the center of this chain. Um, he has something of the animal, and he has something of the God. And it's this, he's the microcosm of reality, and a real sense of purpose and meaning in that. Um, even for the person that doesn't have much um, in the kind of you know, worldly position, there's some kind of meaning in that your position, your reality, by virtue of being human, is that you are the microcosm of all of reality. Um, so that's pretty impressive. And consider that in contrast to that kind of lostness, to that um, disconnectedness that we talk about in modern literature and in modern culture. Uh, and how those two relate. So that's what Houston Smith is getting at, is that um, this technologically, scientifically driven world that we live in um, has some wonderful aspects to it. You know, we don't want to give up our air conditioning and our, you know, modern medicine and, and some things, but that maybe we've thrown off some things that would be of value to us that most of these traditional cultures hold on to. Um, and that's that again is looking at the water we live in. Can we get out of it? Can we critique our own water? Can we critique our own you know, underlying sense of what is real by stepping outside? Um, why does this matter? Well, for one thing, ideas have consequences. Our, our thoughts don't happen in a vacuum. Okay, most people are not reading philosophers. Uh, most people haven't read Nietzsche. Um, haven't considered his idea 
of the Superman or, or um, the Antichrist or God is dead or any of these ideas, um, this kind of alienation or, or you know, the will to power. Most people don't live on the level of really reading that, thinking about that. But but it impacts us through our arts. It, it impacts our art, our entertainment, um, and, and philosophical thinking, philosophical underpinning really impacts us in in a lot of different ways. It, it's it's like the fish to the water. We don't always see it. In fact, because it's so prevalent, we frequently don't see it. Um, but it does affect. The things we do, the way we we value, the things we value, the way we behave, the way we think, the things that we think we can know, uh, the way we think about thinking, there, our our ideas shape that, um, and and it really gives us a story. And the important things about stories, Alasdair McIntyre is an excellent philosopher. There's <clears throat> an incredible book called After Virtue. And he's an ethicist. He says, I can only answer the question, what am I to do, if I can answer the prior question of what story or stories do I find myself a part? Um, people of faith, people within ancient traditions, um, think about the value of the bard to a culture. Um, we're often critical of priests in, in cultures that have priests or you know the witch doctor and cultures that have the the kind of shaman, but those people were the keepers of of the whole mythology, the whole um, sense of reality of a people group. It was they kept their stories, they guarded their stories, and their stories gave them identity and a sense of self, a sense of connectedness to their people, to their community, to the nature around them. <clears throat> and if our story is one of isolation one of stuff is all there is um, you live you pay taxes and you die our stories affect how we live our stories affect how we relate to other people and so <clears throat> it's very important what we accept as our stories oftentimes the stories we accept again without a second thought because they're to us like water is to the fish um, and I, I want to touch on this idea again of progress. Returning back to it, I said that that's kind of our underlying story. <clears throat> but it, it may not be a good story or a true story. Um, and C.S. Lewis was a medieval and Renaissance studies uh, chair at Cambridge, also famous for writing the Chronicles of Narnia. Um, but in his work, uh, in, in, his, in a lecture he gave when he accepted the chair position at Cambridge, um, he was talking about a, a paper that he read that began with 29 pages that contained several misstatements of unrelieved gloom and grossness, superstition and cruelty to children. And on the 29th page comes the sentence, the first rift in this darkness is the Copernican doctrine. As if a new hypothesis in astronomy would naturally make a man stop hitting his daughter about the head. What Lewis is getting at here is the way that we as modern modern culture tend to look at the past and at past cultures. Um, and he's talking about medieval and Renaissance literature, medieval and Renaissance culture, and um, kind of the tendency of a student to think, oh, it was all dark and dreary and gloomy and horrible and superstitious and everybody was cruel and heartless, uh, which is really a shallow picture of what that reality was like. Um, some incredible things came out of the Middle Ages and out of the Renaissance. Um, incredible literature, incredible art, even some of the foundations of our own sciences today. Um, <clears throat> Some incredible theological developments, um, interpersonal developments, political developments. Not all perfect, but um, to think that somehow that was the darkness, and then the fact that Copernicus, you know, convinced people that the sun was the center of the galaxy, not the galaxy, sorry, the sun was the center of the solar system, <coughs> suddenly brings moral light to humanity is really silly. When you consider that, you know, 
in the 600s and 700s and, and, and later you have wealthy um, nobles because of Christianity giving up their wealth to care for the poor, building hospitals in their own homes, building schools. Um, when you consider that, um, you know, talks about superstition, there's a story of, uh, we'll talk about later, that superstition and religious belief are oft, as often as not at odds, not necessarily um, in cooperation. Uh, there's a story of a, a community that a sorcerer claimed to be able to slip through people's keyholes and was terrorizing a village. And when the bishop passed through town and found out about this, uh, the bishop took a stick, a broomstick, and um, <clears throat> invited the sorcerer into an inner chamber and um, invited the heads of the village to watch and um, locked the door, hung the key around his neck inside his robes, and proceeded to beat the sorcerer with the broomstick and say, now, since you can escape through the keyhole, why don't you go ahead and do that? Of course, the sorcerer couldn't. Um, <clears throat> I mean, this is kind of a funny story, but it shows that you know, superstition and religion can be at odds as often as they can be in cahoots. It, it's just people are people, and for that matter, to consider that you know, scientific development suddenly makes us wonderful people. Um, you know, the nuclear bomb is a scientific development. Um, you know, um, concentration concentration camps under the Nazis are mechanized. They run on some pretty scientific principles of how to do this effectively uh, to kill millions of people. It's horrible. Um, <clears throat> so this idea that, you know, this is what Lewis is getting at here, that, that the scientific world gives us all the light we need and, and everything before that was dark is, is just silly and shallow. <clears throat> And, you know, if that kind of progress maybe isn't true on every level, right? I mean, progress as the kind of underlying story maybe isn't true. You have to ask, why, you know, why did we choose progress to think that that's what's the reality of the modern world? Um, there is some progress in some fields, but maybe entropy is a, is a legitimate story. If we want to use a scientific principle for our kind of underlying myth of reality, um, there's a poem written by uh, an atheist, Stephen Dunn, that talks about taking his little girl to the uh, vacation Bible school at the church where he grew up and having her sing the songs and how, you know, appealing that is and yet how sad it makes him feel because now he obviously knows it isn't true. But what's he going to give her in exchange for that beautiful story that she's learned at this Sunday school? Um, because the only story he has is evolution, and the story of evolution stinks of extinction, he says. Um, or think about uh, William Butler Yeats writing, you know, at, following World War I. You know, this is a period of great scientific advancement. Um, he writes The Second Coming, and it begins with turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falconer cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the sinner cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world, the blood dim tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. This is that alienation um, we were talking about uh, in, in modern literature, in the modern world. So, you know, this idea that things are falling apart may be as valid of a picture of the modern world as things are progressing and getting better and better. Um, so it's important, I go through all this, because our stories are important. The fact that we evaluate our stories and understand what our stories are saying, that's an important process. It affects how we think and how we learn what we believe about truth, what we believe about morality, what we believe about societal interaction, it affects our politics. Um, <clears throat> and these are important things to consider.